This video will discuss the linear variational method for computing approximate wave functions of quantum mechanical model systems for which we cannot compute the exact solution. So this video looks very intimidating from the offset with all of the uh, writing on here, but it's not as bad as it looks. So let's take it through step by step. So what we're going to do, just like in the variational method, we're going to assume we have some trial wave function phi. And this trial wave function is going to be a linear combination of basis functions. So sum from n equals 1 to k of a coefficient cn times a function of x, fn of x. If this were a system in three dimensions, this would be f of x, y, z, just a function of however many dimensions you have times a coefficient. So fn of x, each of these individual functions is called a basis function. All of those basis functions together form what is called a basis set. And in this case, I'm going to have k basis functions in my basis set. The set of coefficients that are multiplying the functions are called our variational parameters. So every one of these values of c is going to be a parameter that we can use to help minimize our energy using the variational theorem. So in this case, we're going to do this for just the simplest case of two uh, variational parameters, phi equals c1 f1 of x plus c2 f2 of x. So in direct notation, we'll represent this as c1 times state 1 plus c2 times function 2 is equal to our wave function phi in this ket vector in Dirac notation. We're going to go ahead also and assume that all of our coefficients are real, that instead of being complex, they don't have any imaginary components just for simplicity of derivation, and also that all of our fun basis functions are real at all values of x. So to remind ourselves from the previous videos on the variational method, the energy of our approximate wave function is equal to the integral over all space of phi star h acting on phi, Hamiltonian operator acting on our wave function, divided by the normalization integral, integral over all space phi star times phi. We're going to define two additional terms here. We're going to define the integral hij, which in direct notation is this expectation value, which is the integral over all space of f star i h f, f j. So, and the overlap integral, Sij, which is this Dirac overlap integral, which is the integral over all space, f star i times fj. Again, we don't have to worry about stars in this video because we're assuming that our functions and our coefficients are all real. All right, so what's the expectation value of my Hamiltonian acting on my trial wave function? Well, that's c1 times f1 plus c2 times f2 times h acting on c1, f1, plus c2 times f2. So if I multiply all this out, I'm going to get four separate uh, expectation values of my Hamiltonian. c1 squared, uh, one, f1, h, f1, plus c1, c2, f1, h acting on f2, plus c2, c1, integral over all space, psi2, or f2, h, f1, plus c2 squared integral over all space uh, f2 h acting on f2. So using our notation of h integrals of our expectation values of the Hamiltonian, this is equal to c1 squared h11 plus c1 c2 h12 plus c2 c1 h21 plus c2 squared h22. All right, and since h is a Hermitian operator, we could also show that h12 is equal, equal to h21. I'm not going to prove that right now. I'm just going to assume it and move on. So this line in the, in the middle here, we can get this simplification that this is equal to c1 squared h11 plus 2 c1 c2 h12 from these two middle terms plus c2 squared h22. All right, similar kind of logic for our denominator. The overlap integral, or the normalization integral, is our complex conjugate times our wave function integrated over all space. C1 F1 plus C2 F2 times C1 F1 plus C2 F2. Similarly is going to equal C1 squared integral of 1 star 1 plus C1 C2 integral of 1 star 2 plus C2 C1 integral of 2 star 1 plus c2 squared integral of 2 star times 2. 
All right, once again, without proof, but is more apparent, S12 is equal to S21. But before we get there, I need to, need to move these overlap integrals into our S notation. C1 squared S11 plus C1 C2 S12 plus C2 C1 S21 plus C2 squared S22. And the same kind of trick, S12 equals S21, so this reduces to this final line here. So then we've computed our numerator and denominator. So the energy of our approximate ground state wave function, which is a linear combination of these two basis functions, is equal to the following result. These, these values in terms of the coefficients of each individual basis function, our Hamiltonian integrals, and our overlap integrals. All right, so that's our, that's our energy. Now for the variational method, we need to differentiate with respect to the coefficients and set that derivative equal to zero. So I can do the derivative with respect to C1 of my numerator value here. So if I do that, what I get is 2C1H11 plus 2C2H12. You can, you can convince yourself that that's the derivative with respect to C1 of this term up here. Similarly, the partial derivative with respect to C2, or, or C1 of the numerator, I think this should be C1. Yes, that should be C1. Let's fix that. Much better. So the derivative with respect to C1 of our denominator is 2C1S11 plus 2C2S22, or S12. All right, so now another trick that I'm going to use is the fact that if we multiply both sides here by our denominator, we get e times phi phi is equal to phi h phi. If I take the derivative with respect to c1 of both sides, I took the derivative with respect to my numerator, and that is equal to the derivative of the product of e and phi phi. So I'm taking that this is equal to this times this, so the derivative with respect to c1 of this must be the derivative with respect to C1 of this product here. So if we did that, we got this expression here. So we have this, ex this statement there. So we have the derivative of the energy with respect to C1 must be equal to zero. There's our derivative with respect to C1 in there. We do the product rule on this product. Uh, first times derivative of second plus second times derivative of first, as we see. So I have that equals zero, which is going to be, if we divide, if we subtract e d phi phi d c one, so subtract this to the other side, then divide both sides by one over phi, we'll get the derivative of e with respect to c one isolated. That's gonna be set equal to zero by the variational principle, equals one over phi phi. Partial derivative of phi, of phi h phi, minus e phi phi with respect to c1. So that means if we take this line up here minus e times this line up here, we get a value that's equal to zero. 2c1 h11 plus 2c2 h12 minus e times 2c1 s11 plus 2c2 s12 equals zero. But this isn't only true for c1, it has to be true for C2. And in general, it has to be true for every single coefficient that is in our basis set. All variationable parameters, the energy with respect to them, uh, the derivative with respect to them must be zero. So this actually looks like a matrix equation. If you write the following matrix expression, you have C1 times H11 minus ES11 plus C2 H12 minus E s12 equals zero. And then you can replace the first index you see on each number with two or whatever index you need to go up to. And this is gonna be true for all values of that. So this looks like the following matrix expression. H11, H12, H21, H22 times C1, C2 equals E times S11, S12 s21, s22 times c1, c2. So you'll see if you take this matrix, which is a this with everything moved to the same side, 
If you take this matrix times this vector equals this vector of zero, you'll get this equation here. This is just this column times this row times this column. And if you want this second expression, you get this row times this column. So this is actually what's called the matrix Schrodinger equation. The linear variational method generates this set of matrix equations. HC equals E times S times C. So how do we actually solve for the energies in this case? So we have a matrix times a vector equals zero. So what we would need to do is multiply typically by the inverse of this matrix and then put that over there. Then we get this vector equals the inverse of this matrix times that matrix. But because this is a zero vector, some weird things happen. So what we actually get, the solution to this happens when the determinant of this matrix is equal to zero, whenever this matrix doesn't have an inverse. This equation here is called the secular determinant. So we have, we have this secular determinant equation, and if we compute what these h integrals are based off of our basis functions, we compute what these s integrals are, then we can solve this determinant for what our energies are. So two different ways we can write this in shorthand notation. This matrix here with all the h integrals is called our Hamiltonian matrix. This matrix here with all of our S integrals is called the overlap matrix or the S matrix. And this vector with all of our wave function coefficients is called the coefficient vector or the C vector. So what we have in total is a matrix equation for our wave function as represented by the C vector in terms of our Hamiltonian operator represented by this matrix and our overlap matrix represented by this. So we have HC equals ESC, that is the matrix Schrodinger equation. Whenever our basis functions are orthonormal to one another, the S matrix becomes an identity matrix, and you have the standard Schrodinger equation HC equals EC for H psi equals E psi. And then the secular determinant, the shorthand notation for that will be H minus ES determinant equals zero. So this all seems very abstract for now. Uh, we'll do some examples in the, over the next two videos, simplifying uh, what this means in practice and showing how it's actually done for an example case.